So Fashion Revolution was born after the Rana Plaza disaster in 2013 um, when a factory collapsed and killed over 1,100 people. So we knew then that we needed to transform the industry. So we look at uh, the social and environmental impacts of the fashion industry, look at how we can improve them, but also one of the key tools that we want to implement is transparency. So making uh, people aware of the people who made their clothes and also making sure that the brands uh, protect the workers within the supply chain um, through transparency. Uh, we're doing a project where we are identifying the value chain here in Kenya and trying to figure out where are the points that we can influence policy from a sustainable point of view. So we're hoping that today we'll have a really robust conversation and at the end of it we will have clear recommendations on the directions that Kenya can take. Young people here are interested in working in fashion, film and in festivals. So hence the work that we're doing with Fashion Revolutionaries and a piece of broader work that we're calling Fashion DNA, which Fashion Revolutionary sits under. With relation to the Kenya fashion value chain, um, we've localized the international uh, platform and we'll get into detail about each one of these, each one of these aspects um, in due course. Um, but just to go over it briefly, um, we have research and development, um, which involves things like uh, fabric and textile creation, ideas, um, heavy um, and, and specific construction research, um, creation, which is where designers come into the mix, um, and then obviously the production processes that are involved with creating the then finished goods. Um, once the goods are finished um, and actually products, uh, they go through distribution and sales and that's where auxiliary services come into play. So when we talk of auxiliary services, we mean things like um, styling, photography, models, etc. The majority of the, the demographic cannot afford to spend more than a thousand Kenya shillings and that's 10 US dollars on a, on a purchase. Um, so this is, this is where we have a little bit of a pickle already. So whilst the Chinese imports have a lower cost um, and lower price point, SME importers that make up the bulk of the local textile supply um, that is accessible to our local designers, these fabrics are mainly composed of polyester um, and other harmful synthetics. So the, the, the manufacturers that um, do, however, produce varieties of other textiles is widely focused on export. So they have very high minimums um, and local SME designers cannot fulfill these orders. Early this year, we started doing some work at Uru Market. And Uhuru Market is Nairobi's oldest market. It was set up in 1976. And majority of the traders produce um, school uniforms, um, and then the rest produce kind of like contemporary men's and women's wear, as well as bags. Um, and one of the key complaints was, as I mentioned, you know, the, the, one of the biggest appeals of the market is that the price points are really low. So you, you can go in and you can buy like a full um, set of school uniforms for like under $15, which if you go to any other outfitter in the city, um, you'd probably get one item for $15. But the market is being hit really hard by Chinese imports. Um, so um, Isli, where Garissa Lodge is, and especially for the, for the contemporary men's and women's wear, um, they're, re they're really not selling any of that uh, because people are finding that the Chinese imports are a lot cheaper so the customer base that used to buy that clothing is now buying from Garissa Lodge and Isli, and that's really becoming a point of frustration for the traders. And so their biggest anxiety is that once school uniforms start being imported from China, then, you know, the entire operation is threatened. From the retail end, it's been very interesting to see the, the chain from production to getting into the store, just as she had mentioned. Um, by the time they come to the store, the customer buys it at a very high price. And I think the, the, 
the problems that you can see are either the cost of the raw materials are really expensive, the production here is really expensive. Just as Tobias had said, you might hire someone to do it and they disappear. And from now as a retailer, we do have to work quite closely with our designers to ensure that they're able to still produce and bring items into the store, but we're also understanding that it's not going to be super regular. Like she mentioned something about education. The problem we are having is that the people who sit in places where they can make decisions about what is being taught don't care, don't understand what we're doing. So it's um, we don't have the facilities that we need to train students the way we'd like to. So the way the courses are structured, especially for the public institutions, we focus on so many different things, we're not really specializing. So my students only get to specialize in the third year. That's when they start doing fashion. Then in the fourth year, they're doing a project. So you have one year to teach them everything. And while you're teaching them everything, only about 40% of their work is practical. The rest of it is economics and chemistry and all these other things. I would like to just address a couple of progressions that we've had in this field that are positive. So there is a program that is in very early stages called Nettle in Nakuru. Um, it is a linen-like fabric that is created from stinging nettle. It won the H&M Foundation Award for 2019. Um, and so this is an opportunity for this program to scale up within the Kenyan um, diaspora. Um, it is an opportunity to create at least hundreds of jobs. Um, and so it's really exciting to see how agriculture can play a part in facilitating fashion um, creation in the local sphere, especially when it comes to the question of sustainability. Um, we do have a very unique culture of um, pop-up markets and fairs. So this is something that we found is very popular when it comes to the Kenyan market. However, this is again excluding the mass market. Um, it is a very niche practice. It targets um, probably about 5% of, of the actual economy. So when we, as much as we have this new, innovative, exciting um, kind of sales channel, it's not again targeting the mass market. So we're not actually facilitating and catering for that large demographic um, in the community. So policy is such an important, particularly for fashion, and it is a huge, huge um, factor for success. So in order for a designer to be competitive, policy really has to come into the conversation. Things like import duties, things like uh, fair practices, making sure that um, workers are really being taken care of, all of these things really guarantee if a brand is going to become successful in the international and also local market as well. Government has 
invested heavily when it comes to the mining sector. The miners, um, in, especially in Taita Taveta, where we mine a lot of rubies, they have like a center where I go to the mine, I pick the raw material, at a small fee I access this government facility and I get to polish my gemstones and I proceed um, um, for commercialization. So what about something similar for the textile industry? Yeah, I go collect my fish leather, for example. I have scaled fish, I come, there's a drying facility, I dry. I, you know, cure the leather, I live with some leather that I can either sell or as a fashion designer go and use. From where I'm sitting, there, there's so many small scale SMEs that are producing and producing really nice things made in Kenya. And it is going, even the shoes are going, the textile is going, most of it's in the uniform sector because we've had Mitumba for so many years. But now we have a Friday that we are able to give people something amazing. And on Fridays, if people are wearing Made in Kenya or brand, branded product, which is Kenyan, and then that means it has to be Kenyan. It can't be something made in India and then sold here as a Kenyan product. You know, that doesn't help nobody except a few uh, very sly people, you know, but yeah. so what I'm saying is that um, I would really like to see another meeting where the small garment factories who are having 15 machines, 20 machines, you know, to be a really part of this because this is an opportunity for them to move from 15 machines to 50 machines or from 15 machines to 25 machines even, you know. As an individual, I've struggled with my business. I mean, in terms of finding out where some things are, going to government offices as a person to find out what the solutions are. But then I realized that going to find solution just as an individual with a, with a government or with any organization, it will be very hard. It's better to do it as a group and as a team, and then it's a bigger way of engaging with governments or institutions to be able to take an industry to the next level. My vision basic, basically is going back to our history, going back to our heritage, seeing what our forefathers did in beadwork, and then how then do we come now and transform it into a modern aspect that makes it more attractive for the next generation. Because what you find now is most of the skills are dying, and they're dying with the old people, because no one is trans transferring these skills from old to the young people, mainly because People these days think of it as being an archaic skill or something they're not interested in. So my vision is, or my, um, my challenge is, how then do I come in as a designer to make it attractive for the next generation to pick up and even make it more modern into you know, something more than what I'm doing today. I think for fashion designers, it's, you know, it's, it's easy to get stuck in your work, um, your everyday work that you're trying to do, you're just trying to build a business. Um, but I think it's important to rem remember that you have a voice um, and that you do have influence and that especially by working with other designers, um, other people working in the fashion sector, that, that that's influential and that governments and policymakers they will listen if you just keep knocking on the door so try to remember that you do have a voice you do have power um, you do have something to say and there are people in government agencies um, who have policy influence who want to hear from you well I hope for one that um, we can start implementing more sustainable practices but also build the manufacturing in a sustainable way that respects human rights, respects the environment, doesn't degradate the environment and is internationally renowned for the beautiful beadwork and uh, textiles that it has and I think recognising that will be and selling that story will be one step towards creating a better industry within Kenya.